uh, part of uh, this meeting is being recorded. Are part of a, a three phase uh, research, uh, social science research project that we're doing with Virginia Tech. So this is uh, one of three phases, and we can talk more about those phases at another time, more to come. I just kind of wanted to plant that, um, mention that for all of you. So, okay, Ashley, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Cynthia. I'm going to pull up my screen share here, and then we'll get going. I really appreciate your intro, and uh, I too um, grew up as a wildlife viewer with tons of bird feeders in my backyard. So um, it's fun to be able to build a research program, um, at least partially around wildlife viewing and study a group of people that um, I know pretty well. So Emily, I think I am gonna have to have you share. I don't know why mine keeps um, right. not working. Okay. So Emily's going to pull up the slides here, but as I get started, um, I want to first um, thank the folks in Minnesota Department of Natural Resources Non-Game Wildlife Program. They've been awesome collaborators on this effort. Uh, we've had a, a lot of fun um, working with them, not only on this project, but some other projects that um, we're collaborating on as well that we'll mention in brief um, as we, we go along here. Um, we also, if you can go back one slide, Emily, also wanted to just note the folks who've helped um, sponsor this research. Um, we are part of a collaborative project um, with a bunch of state agencies involved, and that's how this all started, that was funded by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services um, Wildlife and Sport Fish Restoration Program through a multi-state conservation grant, and then also in partnership with the Association for Fish and Wildlife Agencies and the Wildlife Viewing and Nature Tourism Working Group. So that was the source of the broader project that you'll hear about here today, um, as well as our collaboration with the Non-Game Wildlife Program at Minnesota DNR. Okay, so we can get rolling. Thanks everybody for being here. Really appreciate you um, persisting through the various um, mediums that you may have taken going through Teams to come over here to Zoom. And I'm um, glad that we could have such a great audience um, for this presentation. I encourage you all as we go through this presentation today to think about a couple of questions. I want you to think about what that you're seeing here is surprising to you or unexpected. And then I also want you to think about what from what you're seeing here is relevant to your work. What might cause you to adapt what you're already doing or tell you that what you're doing is, is probably a correct direction to be heading in if you wanna be working with wildlife viewers or what might cause you to think about new collaborations that you could be involved in. We tried to organize this presentation so it really helps set up your work. And so we hope that you can, can walk away with those sorts of insights today. Okay. So we're talking about this report that we just recently released, the Minnesota Wildlife Viewer Survey Results. Um, we have dropped the link to that in the chat. Additionally, uh, the QR code works if you hold up your phone to it. If you haven't already had a chance to check out the report, please do. If you have had a chance, um, hopefully here today we'll reinforce and call out some of the key highlights from it. Uh, it's a long report and there's lots of tables and lots of figures and lots of different um, ways to think about the data that's in there. We are not going to walk you through every single page in there. Instead, we're gonna to try to have a compelling presentation today that um, focuses on the highlights. But if there's a section that you see us present on today and you're, you think, oh, I wish I knew more about that, I encourage you to check out that part of the report because it may be that there's more insight in there that um, could be helpful to you. So, so definitely do check it out later. There's also an executive summary section it's a few pages long and calls out the highlights across all of the sections of the report. And then there's a recommendation section at the very end of it that's again a few pages long that we worked and um, with Minnesota DNR staff to um, help make sure that it's relevant to your agency. So that's a little bit of the big picture about the report. This has been a team effort. Uh, I work with a great group of people, uh, specifically those who worked on this report are listed here. 
Emily Sinclair is the lead on this report. She is a master's student who's been involved in all aspects of the, the broader regional and national project, as well as the state project. Kelsey Jennings um, is a master's student as well in our program. Kelsey also is involved in the national and regional um, project, as well as works closely with Minnesota DNR and the additional spinoff projects that I was mentioning. Um, Morgan Kearns is an undergraduate research assistant who is very involved in working on this report and has contributed to a bunch of our other reports as well. And then Christy Potatsky is a PhD student um, who is not able to join us here today, but Christy um, also has worked really closely with Emily on all of the state reports and contributed to this one as well. Additionally, we have some other collaborators at Virginia Tech who've been part of the broader project. So um, it's really been a, a great group and, and a team effort. And you'll see that today when we present, Emily, Kelsey, and I are going to take turns presenting. So here's what we hope to accomplish uh, during our time that we have here together. We are hoping that you can walk away understanding who are these wildlife viewers in Minnesota and what can Minnesota DNR and you and your job do to support wildlife viewers, to broaden relevance to wildlife viewers who do not hunt and fish and may not have as much of a relationship um, with your agency, particularly the parts of your agency that, that work on wildlife um, issues, and then develop um, financial support opportunities for wildlife viewers. I know a lot of agencies um, have interest in how can you foster that even further. And your agency has some more opportunities than some other states do. But still, I think there's some insights for how to develop that even further. All right, I'm gonna turn things over to Emily now. Oh, so no, I'm doing the survey background. Sorry, Emily, you're like, don't do that. I'm not ready for it. So let's talk a little bit about why we got involved in this survey. Um, Cynthia has already shared some of her thoughts on why Minnesota DNR was interested, but I'm gonna share sort of bigger picture. Why did, why did the project start um, at the, the national level? So first I wanna make sure we're all on the same page about what wildlife viewing means. Wildlife viewing is closely observing feeding and photographing wildlife, visiting parks or natural areas to observe, feed or photograph wildlife, and maintaining plantings and natural areas for the benefit of wildlife. I realize that many state agencies are not interested in promoting feeding of wildlife, um, particularly feeding of, of mammals or herbs um, or, or fish or, or whatever else people might be deciding to, to feed. Um, we looked at feeding of birds separate from feeding of other wildlife, which I'll show you those insights. And the reason we still had feeding in this definition is because we were trying to be consistent with the National Survey for Hunting, Fishing, and Wildlife Related Recreation that has been administered for so many years and has some, some insights about the numbers of wildlife viewers that are out there and some, some foundational pieces that we then use to make sure that our methods were working as well for reaching the same sort of people. So that's the, the reason for that. Okay, let's talk about trends in wildlife viewing. Probably a lot of you are aware there's a lot of wildlife viewers in your state. Um, 1.6 million adults in Minnesota. Uh, said that they viewed wildlife in the 2011 National Survey. Um, additionally, the, the National Survey uh, across the nation shows that there's 14.3 million additional viewers in the U.S. between the year of 2011 and 2016. So there seems to be an increase in that participation rate. We don't have specific um, Minnesota data to show you there, but we'd assume that it's tracking in the same sort of way. The rise that the National Survey found was primarily in around the home wildlife viewing, which you're going to see um, that um, strong interest carry through this presentation as well with what we found. At the same time, hunting and angling rates are declining or remaining stable. And so we are aware that many state agencies have an interest in how can they draw broader or stronger connections to wildlife viewers who don't also hunt and fish, and they may not have as much of a relationship to particularly related to their wildlife work. I recognize in your agency, you have a very broad agency with your parks program and, and have connections um, in, in other ways. So in addition to this um, trend piece as a rationale for our work, we also then talked with the state agencies that were part of our steering committee 
for the project, which Cynthia sat on as well. And we were interested in, in why was it that they wanted to know more about wildlife viewers? What were they hearing from within their agency? And it was really helpful for us to ask this question so that we could make sure that we looked at um, insights that would help inform these needs. So one, the trend, growing number of viewers, and there's the potential with that growing number of viewers for people who can be influential and in being a voice for wildlife conservation, people who can um, be supporters of wildlife conservation and state agencies who serve um, those who are interested in wildlife. A lot of folks also said to us, it's hard for us to reach out to viewers. And this, this was something we heard more, again, from agencies that, that don't also have um, parks and other components in the agency. They said, we've got a licensed database and we've got an angling database, but we don't have a viewer database. And so there's not a straightforward way for us to connect with, with viewers. And they really felt like there was a lack of, of information on viewers' thoughts, preferences, and behaviors. The National Survey has shared some information um, that's been very useful to states on understanding how many people in a state view, which is what I just showed you, how much money um, those folks spend on viewing, maybe what kind of wildlife they're interested in viewing, but doesn't dig as much into like what are their attitudes about state agencies and what's the best way that a state agency can serve them. And how are they already interacting with state agencies? What are they doing related to conservation? So there was a lot of interest there in, in building out what we know about viewers in each state. And, it, and agencies fundamentally were interested in this because they wanted to be able to work more uh, effectively with viewers, be able to better serve them, communicate with them. And there's also the realization that folks that may be underserved currently or underrepresented or historically excluded from opportunities related to wildlife might have an interest already in viewing, or that might be a good way to get them um, more connected to wildlife um, is through viewing. And then finally, this piece of, of viewers being um, able to potentially be another supporter financially for agencies and, and thinking about mechanisms to facilitate that, especially since there's been attempts in a lot of states to try to do something that would be more appropriate for viewers, and they haven't had as much luck with that. Just one thing I wanted to say about it, about what I just listed there. If you have any other ideas for why you came to the webinar and were interested in learning more about viewers, feel free, free to throw that in the chat pod. It would be helpful for us to know if there's other reasons that people want this sort of um, information. So I've shared here just a little bit of a background on wildlife viewing and, and why it's relevant to study. Cynthia did as well. I want to mention that we did a literature review at the beginning of this project where um, Emily and Kelsey spent a lot of time pouring through all of the journal articles, gray literature that they could find related to wildlife viewing, primarily in the US, but in some cases, even outside of the US. And they summarized all of those insights in a really easy to read um, a literature review document that's um, an easy size to sit down and just read in an hour or a little bit less. And um, it, it goes through like, well, who are wildlife viewers? What do wildlife viewers think about agencies? And so they pulled all of that together and made it so that you don't have to read the journal articles yourself, but you can get what's known in the literature. And if you want to dig in on something, you can look at the references list and, and then track down where they found that source. So again, Kelsey's put that in the chat for you. And finally, I've alluded a couple of times to a national and regional survey that we did that was the foundation for then using that same survey with some adaptation for Minnesota. If you wanna check out the national and regional survey results and you haven't already um, seen those, there's a copy of the report um, that's available to you. And you can check that out, or if you have colleagues in another state agency that did not get state-specific data, they might be interested in, in seeing this as well. We're also going to talk about some case studies today, and we'll mention that there's even more info on those case studies in the national and regional report. All right, now for real, I'm going to turn it over to Emily, who's going to introduce herself. Excellent. Thank you for the introduction, Ashley, and thanks to all of you for being here. I'm really excited to see that there's over 90 people from Minnesota who wanted to learn more about wildlife viewers today. And I hope that you're able to take something meaningful from this presentation back to your work wherever you are in the agency. 
I'm going to start out by talking about the methods for the survey before reviewing a little bit of our results, then passing it back to Ashley and Kelsey to share with you some discussions and potential recommendations. But first, we conducted a panel questionnaire to answer the questions in the survey. A panel survey is a platform that recruits people from across the country to take surveys as potential survey takers. They are then compensated with some, um, normally like a potentially an Amazon gift card or another form of cash compensation for their time taking the survey. I'll share a little bit more about panel surveys later on, but I just wanted to let you know what type of survey I'm talking about. In Minnesota, we had 1,002 respondents, so just over 1,000 people from the state take the survey. And the survey was conducted online from October to December of 2021, so just about exactly a year ago. There are 117 questions on the survey, so we were able to learn quite a bit about wildlife viewers there in Minnesota. Our survey began first with a screening question. This screening question asked individuals in which, if any, of the following forms of wildlife viewing have you participated in in the past five years? And to spice things up a little bit, I'm going to try to ask you all that same survey right now in this Zoom poll, just asking what's your favorite type of wildlife viewing behavior so we can see how you all in Minnesota compare. So if you see this question, if someone could give me a thumbs up if they see it, why don't you go ahead and check off your favorite wildlife viewing behavior and I'll leave a couple moments for people to take that now. So it looks like traveling to parks and natural areas is the most popular activity. We don't have anybody feeding other wildlife yet and we've got over half of you taken it. So I'm just gonna give a couple more seconds and then see, and then I'll close this down. All right, Chris is cir circling everything. That's great. I don't know if you all can see that. All right, looks like just about 70% of you took it. So I'll pause and try to share the results with you. Can you see that poll? So it looks like with our webinar participants, closely observing wildlife is the most popular wildlife viewing activity, followed by traveling to parks and natural areas to observe, feed, or photograph wildlife. Nobody in this group of over 90 said that they like to feed other wildlife. Thanks for participating, guys. And our survey um, online, if, no, if somebody didn't select any of those questions, they said, I don't participate in any of those behaviors, they were removed from our survey as we weren't interested in studying people who didn't in participate in intentional forms of wildlife viewing. You may also be wondering what questions we were covering in the survey beyond just these wildlife viewing behaviors. We examined the demographic characteristics of wildlife viewers their viewing behaviors and interests, so feeding wild birds, what types of wildlife they like to view. We examine the duration, location, and frequency of participation in wildlife viewing. So are they around their home? Are they on state lands? We looked at their participation in other outdoor recreation, so try to see where that overlap is of viewers. We examined their level of specialization, like their skill level and owning equipment. We wanted to briefly examine their wildlife viewing related expenditures, so we took a quick look at trip related and other costs associated with wildlife viewing. We looked at their barriers and social support in participating in wildlife viewing, which is something Kelsey will briefly touch on later on, and their likelihood of participating in conservation behaviors. We also really wanted to use the survey to examine how wildlife viewers interact with the MNDNR there in Minnesota. We first examined their familiarity with, perceptions of, and trust of the Minnesota DNR. After that, we took a look at their experiences with the programs and services you all offer as an agency. We also looked at their past financial contributions to the MNDNR, as well as their likelihood to support the MNDNR financially and through conservation behaviors in the future. Finally, and one of the more interesting items to me, we examined their preferred forms of viewing support from the agency, as well as communication. So like which social media platform or if it's in person or printed, these wildlife viewers are interested in. So now that you know a little bit more about what we were covering in the survey, I'll again remind you that we conducted this panel survey online. It's that online survey platform of individuals recruited to take surveys who then receive some form of compensation. These are something that are increasingly becoming more popular as we move further and further into the 21st century. Social scientists used to conduct a lot of research on through the mail or through phone calls, but response rates are going down for those forms of sampling. So online surveys are becoming increasingly popular. 
to make sure we have a really strong and truly representative data set, we added attention checks, time limits, and quotas to our survey, which I'll examine more in the next slide. So the first thing we added to the survey were attention checks. And these were a series of about five or six statements that were that consisted of pairs of conflicting statements. So for example, I trust the Minnesota DNR, and then I don't trust the Minnesota DNR. If somebody said they strongly agreed with both of those statements, that would put off a little flag for us saying, hey, this person kind of filled in these contradictory statements. They might not be reading the survey very closely. Maybe they're going through a little bit fast, and you should consider this person potential. If a person failed these attention checks twice, they were then removed from our final data set. So those 1,002 survey responses we took were only the people who passed those checks. Another mechanism we added for data quality was minimum completion time. And this was the limit we set based off of a pilot of their survey throughout the question to try to identify about how long it took the average person to complete the survey. And then we just set a limit at the first quartile or like the 25% mark from that time. And anybody who completed the survey faster than that was also removed as it wasn't as likely they had paid as much attention to it. Our data set is also online and published. If you're interested in doing any of this analysis yourselves, I think Kelsey has the link that they'll share with us here if you want to take a closer look. It also includes a full PDF of the survey instrument. So if you'd like to take a look at that and just follow along, you're more than welcome to. After we completed the sampling, the removing of people who failed those attention checks and time limits, we began data analysis. We normally did descriptive statistics for statewide results, but we used chi-square tests, t-tests, to compare some differences between consumptive and non-consumptive viewers in, in Minnesota. And as I referenced on that um, previous slide, the data set is now available for you all. I wanted to pause here and to discuss a little bit more about these consumptive and non-consumptive viewers. Now, I know there's a lot of debate in the natural resource world, including on the agency side and the academia side of is non-consumptive viewers the best term because uh, non-consumptive viewers or wildlife viewers sometimes can put some form of harm on the environment. Maybe they're stressing or destroying some grass when they go out and hike or photograph. And so this nature of the idea that wildlife viewers aren't taking anything from the environment or are non-consumptive might not be truly representative. Consumptive viewers are traditionally defined as those who participate in hunting and angling, but some people participate in catch and release fishing, so they're not necessarily consuming or taking from the environment. That said, we did use these two terms to just divide these two groups up, as we thought they could have some really unique patterns between the two of them. We found, in fact, that just under half of wildlife viewers in Minnesota were consumptive wildlife viewers, which meant that in addition to participating in wildlife viewers, they said, I've participated in hunting, angling, or both of these activities in the past five years. Just over half of our viewers in Minnesota were non-consumptive wildlife viewers, meaning that they didn't participate in hunting and angling, and when they're participating in wildlife-related recreation, they're just wildlife viewing. To take a closer look at our consumptive viewers, 32% of all viewers in Minnesota said that they were only anglers and wildlife viewers. Only 4% of wildlife viewers in Minnesota are hunters and wildlife viewers, and about 16% of our total sample fish, hunt, and view wildlife. There's a few slides in this presentation where we take a look at our consumptive and non-consumptive viewers. They're really different in some ways, but really similar in others. We think this is a great way to kind of understand and identify potential target audiences for managing for wildlife viewing. The final method of ensuring that our survey was representative were called demographic quotas. The quota is when we set a certain standard for demographic features. In this case, it was age, gender, and education against a known sample. By matching up these features in our panel survey, we were hoping to align it a little bit better with the national survey of fishing, hunting, and wildlife associated recreation. So these are our findings for age, gender, and education from the survey here in Minnesota. And if you're familiar with the national survey, you'll see it matches all, almost perfectly with their demographics. And this was just a step we took to try to make sure we had a really representative sample of wildlife viewers in Minnesota. All the demographic characteristics I'm sharing from here on out weren't set for a quota, so they're just the natural things we found in our sample. We also examined the ethno-racial identity of wildlife viewers here in Minnesota. 
Kelsey Jennings is going to share a little bit more insight on these findings and how to manage and promote inclusivity in wildlife viewing. But I did want to highlight this box here on the left of my screen that says 81% of our sample in Minnesota was white and non-Hispanic, and 19% was BIPOC or Black, Indigenous, and people of color, which meant that they were potentially white and one other race or ethnicity, or they identified as one or multiple other race or ethnicities. We also examined the income of wildlife viewers in Minnesota. We found that just over a third of the respondents in the state reported their income as under 50,000, while just about another third of them reported their total household income of 100,000 or more. This next graph here is the first graph kind of calling out those colors and looking at the differences between our consumptive and non-consumptive viewers in Minnesota. We asked our wildlife viewers, how would you characterize the area in which you lived and provided these classifications of rural area, small town, small city or urban area. We found a statistically significant difference between our consumptive and non-consumptive viewers when they indicated where that they lived. And this meant that we did notice that there were slightly more wildlife viewers who are non-consumptive living in urban areas and slightly more consumptive viewers reported living in rural areas than non-consumptive viewers. As a throwback to that quick survey you all just took, we did ask about what forms of wildlife viewing they've participated in in the past five years. And kind of similar to what you all said, they participate in wildlife viewing by visiting parks and natural areas, photographing or taking pictures of wildlife and feeding wild birds. You will notice that kind of similar to you all, uh, feeding other wildlife was the least common activity these wildlife viewers participated in though just under 40% of our total samples that they did participate in feeding other wildlife. Also wanted to highlight that 78% of viewers in Minnesota are interested in viewing land mammals, which I thought was really interesting as it was very close to the portion of the responses that said they view wild birds as well. And with that, I'm gonna pass it back over to Ashley, who's gonna give an introduction to our five key insights and recommendations from the survey. Great. Thanks so much, Emily. Before I get started, I just want to respond to a point that Lisa um, brought up in the chat. Um, Lisa suggests that it would be interesting to look at the geographic distribution within Minnesota of the respondents as well. And I do think that's a great point. We do have the zip code of the respondents um, available. If anyone in the agency has a great corresponding list of zip codes, and the regions you have in the agency, it would be pretty easy for us to tell you what percent of people were in each of those regions, but um, we don't have a great list of how to how to look at your zip codes. So just wanted to throw that out there, um, that that could be an, an easy thing for us to, to get you info on. All right, so let me share um, key insights um, with you. Um, we have tried to organize these in a way that corresponds with the recommendations in the report. So we're not just going to show you all the data and then go to the recommendations at the end. Instead, we're going to talk about the recommendations with the data that supports that woven in so that hopefully it will um, make a bit more of, um, I guess, cause us all not to, to become um, overwhelmed by so many um, tables and figures and instead make the insights stand out a bit more. So first three insights are related to how can you work to better support wildlife viewers in Minnesota. So there's lots of evidence from the survey that shows that they would be useful to provide more wildlife viewing information and access to wildlife viewers. As well, as you'll see, many different um, insights point to the, the benefit of focusing on around the home viewing opportunities as a way to connect with a broad group of wildlife viewers in the state. And then also developing social support networks for wildlife viewers. In addition, there's um, potential to really broaden the relevance of the agency to wildlife viewers who do not hunt and fish, who don't have a strong connection um, with the agency currently, and then also develop financial contribution opportunities for wildlife viewers, which you'll see um, how, how that might be most effective to do. So I'm going to start with number one here. So the top five ways um, in Minnesota that wildlife viewers report that the agency could better support their viewing primarily relate to information. You'll see my first, second, and then fourth and fifth um, top 
uh, response here relates to information. So more information about where to see wildlife, more information about the wildlife, more information about how to view wildlife, more information about where and when to view wildlife where there's no hunting. And those range from about half of the respondents saying that that would be something that they'd really like to see to about a third. So Emily's brought up all the response options now that we gave folks. So you can see this is an example of how if you actually go into the report, you can see a lot more data and see those ones are popping up at the top with access to more places to wildlife view also being in the top. And then there's many other options that we gave people as well. What you'll see is there's not much difference here between consumptive and non-consumptive viewers. Uh, any place where there's an asterisk next to the option, that's where there's a difference between the consumptive and non-consumptive groups in green and purple. And across the board, um, these, these folks are all interested in, in more info and more access, as well as some of the other options below. So in thinking then about how you could provide more information to wildlife viewers, you all already have a nice nature viewing um, section of your website, more advanced than what a lot of other state agencies have that we've been checking out. And you can see that it does provide that information about native wildlife, how, how to get more involved in viewing or how to get more involved in birding, and then also how you could volunteer as well. See, there's lots of tips on the side showing some locations where people could go to see these things. And it might just be useful to think about how those key types of information that people were saying they were interested in can be easily found in this section. Of course, finding a viewing destination, you all have a lot of information related to, which is um, very useful to viewers. So also I think uh, a useful insight for you all to be thinking about is what sort of skill level do most of these viewers have and, and why might that relate to them being interested in more information? Viewers are largely beginners and novice, um, and then also intermediate within your state. Just over half identify as beginner or novice. And this has been really surprising to a lot of the state agencies because we found similar results across state. And they say, well, most of the people that we hear from and talk to and see at birding festivals or see on our lands are more of the advanced or intermediate uh, wildlife viewer. But actually there's a lot of people out there who are still at that beginner or novice level and um, they might be ones that could really benefit from those additional uh, sources of information that were so of interest to your respondents. And then in terms of how viewers are interested in hearing from your agency, the website was the most common response. We found that across most of the states that we've worked with followed by email updates, printed materials, and then also Facebook. So a lot of the common ways that you're probably already reaching out to folks, we know you've got a bunch of different Facebook pages from um, your agency as well. So trying to continue to think about how can you push out these types of information through these mechanisms that you already have available to you. If you're interested in all the different channels that you might be able to reach um, your respondents, Again, we asked about a lot more than those top four that I just showed you. And you can see that it's considerably less percentage of people who had an interest in, in some of the options like TikTok or blogs. Um, but an analysis looking at um, responses by age would likely show that there are some differences depending on age cohort of people. You can see again, not that many differences between the consumptive and non-consumptive viewers other than there's a little bit more interest from your consumptive viewers in a few of those mechanisms. So this question of improving access, uh, we've seen this again also in a lot of states and the, the question is asked, are people saying they need more access because there's really not enough access out there for wildlife viewing or is it because they don't know where they can go for wildlife viewing because they also said they want more information about that. And we don't know for sure what the, the answer is there because we weren't able to call up people after they take the survey and ask them about the access piece. But we would guess that part of it is tied to that needing more information component that they said they were interested in. You all do have birding trails in your state. You have many state parks. You have state natural areas. 
there's there's multitude of places where people can look for opportunities. One thing that we would encourage you to think about is across the places where you do have opportunities for people to view, are they in the areas where you have large components of your population since there was such a strong interest in viewing close to home? Also, a lot of viewers said that they were interested in um, being able to view on state managed lands, and those are lands that you manage, so there's plenty of opportunity there. In terms of the other barriers that people called out to being able to view more, the distance to the viewing location came out on the top, lack of free time, and not knowing where to go. And so these three pieces together, again, over half of your survey respondents are saying that those are struggles to them being able to view more, point to that need to make opportunities for viewing really easy for people to find and really close to home so that they don't have to spend as much time getting there or they don't have to figure out how to get there or they don't have to spend the money to get there either. So with that, I'm going to turn things over to Emily to talk more about this around the home viewing piece. Thank you, Ashley. Um, just to build on what Ashley was saying, we think that one great avenue for the Minnesota DNR to connect with more wildlife viewers is if they develop the means to support those who view around their homes. To spotlight this point a little bit more, we found that around my own home or property was the most popular wildlife viewing location in the state for both consumptive and non-consumptive viewers. In fact, just under one in four, just under three in four wildlife viewers in Minnesota participate in wildlife viewing around their own home or property. The other common locations for wildlife viewing was locally managed areas, and I do want to highlight the state managed areas that you all, some of you may be responsible for, um, that over half the percentage of wildlife viewers in Minnesota participate in. Another aspect of wildlife viewing that's been really interesting to us to take a look at is conservation behaviors. We know that wildlife viewers are conservationists, but we also examined how likely they are to participate in some forms of wildlife viewing or conservation behaviors with or in support of the Minnesota DNR. I did spotlight three areas, this uh, cleaning up trash or litter, enhancing wildlife habitat, or collecting data on wildlife habitat that are somewhat close to managing habitat that you could do in or around the home for wildlife viewing. But I did want to point out the fact that wildlife viewers were most likely to participate in cleaning up trash or litter, purchasing environmentally friendly products, or participating in civic engagement related to wildlife conservation with or in support of the state agency. These three behaviors are great opportunities for the Minnesota DNR to maybe provide a chance of like a cleaning up trash day through the agency as a way to first connect with these wildlife viewers and then kind of open the door to building a little bit more of a relationship with them in the state. And with that, I'm going to pass things over to Kelsey Jennings, who will take a little bit more of a look at wildlife viewing and building social support. Yeah, thank you, Emily. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kelsey. Uh, I work in the Parks and Trails Department before moving on to my master's here at Virginia Tech. So I'm happy to be back talking to all of you. Uh, and I want to specifically talk about how the DNR could develop and increase social support networks for wildlife viewers, particularly those who've been historically underserved in wildlife recreation and by state agencies. So we're talking about people who are Black, Indigenous, and people of color, and then also people with disabilities and anybody else who really fits into those groups who may or may not have been historically served by the DNR. So in our results, we see that family and friends are the most commonly reported type of social support uh, for all people across Minnesota. And we think that this could be um, an opportunity to move into supporting people like mentors. So there's a lot of opportunities to grow mentorship support where they might be more challenging to grow support in like family and friend networks. That's something that we often don't have access to. But so building uh, mentor support networks can be relatively easily achieved through things like providing low cost entry to parks uh, and engaging friends groups. I worked with uh, Fort Snelling State Park. So engaging people like the friends of Fort Snelling State Park to provide really location specific opportunities and direct mentorship for people who are interested in growing uh, their, their expertise with wildlife viewing. But I wanna dig a little bit more into supporting BIPOC viewers in Minnesota as well. So we saw that about 19% of the people who responded to the survey identify as Black, Indigenous, or people of color. And this really similarly matches the state of Minnesota's racial uh, and ethno demographics. But what we see specifically with 
larger nationwide trends is that our BIPOC participants often struggle with this don't loop. So this theory was first described by John Robinson in the early 2000s, but it essentially is seeking to explain that discrepancy. And it says that if you don't meet others who are engaged in a particular activity, the odds are that you are not going to take interest in that activity yourself. So essentially, if you don't know people who do something, you're probably not going to get involved in something because the the hump to get over to participate in that is much, much higher. So with this context, I wanna talk about some of the programs that exist for this. I wanted to start with the programs that we're working with, with the non-game wildlife programs, specifically engaging BIPOC in community science work. So in 2020, we partnered, uh, the DNR non-game wildlife program partnered with Virginia Tech, and we're really working to understand existing and effective BIPOC community science programs. But we're also moving into doing focus groups specifically with BIPOC program practitioners and participants. So we just wrapped up doing a couple of focus groups with people who are practitioners of these programs, so it's people who are leading hiking tra uh, trails, leading you know, canoeing trips, things like that, uh, specifically for BIPOC communities, and many of those participants are members of the BIPOC communities themselves. And then we're moving into this phase where we're going to talk to, with people who are participating in a lot of these programs to understand things like what does most effectively support you in your outdoor recreation? What kind of outdoor recreation are you interested in? What kind of community science are you doing? And how could you, uh, or what are you excited about doing more of to really understand how we can build these more mutually beneficial relationships with the BIPOC communities across Minnesota? We're just working on starting those second round of focus groups now. So we are expecting to have those results hopefully in early 2023, but we'll see how long it takes you to write everything like that up. The other program I wanted to talk about is a specific program out of South Carolina that has been around for about seven years now that focuses really intentionally on BIPOC community engagement. So the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources began this community engagement um, program as a program that was aimed to serve their rapidly growing Hispanic and Latina community, which was historically underengaged but was growing at a vast rate. And they really achieved success in this by hiring a Hispanic outreach coordinator who could both speak the language and understand the cultural history of the communities they were working with, as well as be able to uh, relate the wildlife management back to these communities. And this Hispanic outreach coordinator was able to do this through things like bilingual resources and having outreach strategies that are, again, uh, important and relevant to those communities. And after the success of this Hispanic outreach uh, program, they were actually able to move into a similar strategy to start to reach their Black and African-American communities in South Carolina as well. And this just shows that having people who can share affinity with the groups that you're looking to engage can really help build those relationships and develop those really important culturally uh, relevant types of community science and outdoor recreation programs. With that, I'm gonna pass it back to Emily to talk a little bit about birdability. Thank you. Another group that we examined in the survey that was traditionally underserved by agencies is people with disabilities. To study or identify people with disabilities in the survey, we asked them to what extent do you experience accessibility challenges, which is the definition you'll see on my slide now. So accessibility challenges are the difficulties someone experiences in interacting with or while using the physical or social environment while trying to engage in a meaningful activity such as wildlife viewing or birding. This may be a result of mobility challenges, blindness or low vision, intellectual or developmental disabilities, mental health illness, or being deaf or hard of hearing or other health concerns. And in Minnesota, we actually found that 31% of all wildlife viewers experience somewhat quite a bit or a great deal of accessibility challenges when wildlife viewing, which equates to roughly one in three of all your viewers. One way to promote inclusion for this group in Minnesota might be to spotlight more accessible birding or wildlife viewing locations. This is a map, and I think Kelsey will be able to put a link in the chat, that Birdability promotes, which is this user-based software where individuals will go out to a site and evaluate it for accessibility and then upload it so other people with disabilities or accessibility challenges can access this site as well. One step that you could do to promote inclusivity would just be to potentially add some sites that you think are really accessible and you'd like to see more people at, or just take a look at what the sites are that are accessible and try to spotlight those to a broader audience. And with that, I'm gonna pass things back to Ashley for our final two discussion points and to close out the presentation. 
Thanks, Emily. I just wanted to say way to go, uh, Minnesota, checking out um, the birdability map in your state. You have a lot more um, diamonds on there than a lot of other states do. So um, you, you have a lot of good opportunities for people to be um, who have accessibility, accessibility challenges to be viewing. And you also have done a good job of getting that into the, the website. So if anyone on here has been putting those in, way to go. All right, so let's talk now about how to broaden relevance to wildlife viewers who do not hunt or fish. So we've talked about um, these two terms, the consumptive viewer and the non-consumptive viewer. So we want to think a little bit more about if you have an interest in broadening to non-consumptive viewers who don't currently hunt and fish, this might be um, a good thing to do because they tend to have different perceptions and experiences with your agency currently and there seems to be an opportunity to increase their familiarity with the agency and provide tailored support. So how familiar are you with Minnesota DNR was a question that we asked um, respondents to our survey. And I will say that your agency had a higher level of familiarity amongst folks than a lot of other agencies did. Again, I think because you have a much broader agency than just a specific fish and wildlife agency. But still you see, that those folks who are consumptive viewers or people who are involved in lots of different types of recreation, fishing and wildlife viewing, have a higher level of familiarity. There's more of those dark colors indicating higher levels of familiarity um, with the agency compared to the non-consumptive viewers who are engaged in less types of wildlife recreation and they don't have as high level of familiarity with the agency. We also were interested in looking at familiarity in another way. We wanted to look at people's recognition of the logo. So we thought that this would be a great way to go. And you all had really high recognition of your logo. And then Kelsey pointed out to us, you know that that logo is the same thing that's on our driver's license. So your agency, because uh, your state, because you use that same logo across all of your departments um, has high recognition. Um, maybe 5% of people who said no don't have the driver's license and, and haven't seen it, um, but it, or maybe they actually read the part about Department of Natural Resources. But your logo recognition, no difference across groups and wasn't a particularly useful question in your, your state for us to understand familiarity with your agency. So thought that you would enjoy a little chuckle about that one. In terms of programs and services that people have participated in or used in the last five years, you can see here that we've got about 30% or less saying that they've been involved in these various programs or services. This was a list that came from the national and regional survey. And so it might not, it might not look like it's perfectly tailored to you all. And that's because we had to try to come up with categories that were broad enough that they worked across all of the states. But then working with Cynthia and her team in the non-game wildlife program, we selected out those that would be relevant to your agency. So you can see information with wildlife is the, the top things that viewers have found, as well as going to your, your lands, um, followed by your nature, education, and visitor centers. So you all do have a lot of opportunities for connecting with folks in that way. One difference that I do want to point out here that's, again, not as quite as pronounced as what we've seen in some of the other states is that the non-consumptive viewers have had less interaction with you. So 35% of non-consumptive viewers say they've never, or at least not in the last five years, participated in any of these types of opportunities, where it's only 26% for the consumptive viewers. So as a take home here, Two in three or two thirds of non-consumptive viewers have experience with um, the programs and services, which is great. And I think something to really celebrate is you are touching them in so many, so many different ways or, or a large proportion of these people. But there's still a third that there's this opportunity to connect with even more as a new audience for your agency. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about um, non-voluntary contributions as a way that people might be connecting with you as well as voluntary contributions. So a non-voluntary contribution is what we consider things that people have to pay towards the agency in order to be able to do something. So a fishing license or a lands access fee. Whereas a voluntary contribution is if you decide to get a license plate, which you don't have to get the conservation license plates, or you decide to provide a donation to an agency. 
um, as something that you could voluntarily do. So we're interested in how much are these two different groups connecting with your agency in terms of contributions. And we, we found again that there's some more opportunity on the, the non-consumptive side of viewers. So fishing license, that consumptive viewer group, not surprising, have a lot of them have purchased a fishing license because a lot of them were also reporting that they do fish. And then also uh, a lot of them had purchased a hunting license in the past five years as well. Uh, again, lower percentage of difference though for fees for a program or event hosted by the agency and also um, required conservation or habitat stamps. And you'll see that for, for most of these, they have a much larger green bar here indicating that the con consumptive group has a larger involvement in non-voluntary contributions to the agency. Now, if we look at the voluntary contributions, again, we see this same pattern generally of that consumptive viewer group being a, a bit higher than the non-consumptive group. The difference isn't quite as pronounced here, but one of the key things I do like to point out is there's overall a pretty low percentage of involvement um, in these voluntary ways of contributing to the agency across both of these groups. So when people have uh, a way that they have to contribute to the agency, of course, those mechanisms have, have more involvement. The differences aren't as pronounced here across those groups either. There's only a, a few that we see a difference between the consumptive and non-consumptive group though. So those tangible products, voluntary conservation or habitat stamp and direct donation of money are a bit higher for consumptive viewers. So I, I do want to point out, and you've seen that with the places where we don't have any difference, that there is a lot of common ground um, amongst these groups. Uh, about 25% of both of these groups of viewers feel that the agency could do more to prioritize programs and services for wildlife viewing. A lot of them also feel that what you're doing is about right. Um, and very few of them uh, it's about 10% or so think that it's too much that you're doing for, for viewing programs. So, uh, you know, it, it seems like you would have very few people who would be disappointed if you, you did more and um, a, a lot of shared belief that there could be um, more done for wildlife viewers. All right, so let's dig into this financial contribution piece a little bit more. So I've mentioned that your non-voluntary contributions um, have higher um, participation, which I know isn't surprising to you. That's where you get most of your funding. And uh, likewise, um, there seems to be, especially for those non-voluntary, but also to some case with the voluntary group, larger involvement for consumptive viewing. The interesting thing, though, is when we ask people about looking to the future, would you be likely to contribute to the agency in these various ways? The percentages were a lot higher than what's actually happening, except for in the case of the fishing license. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity, I think, to continue to encourage people to take advantage of these voluntary contrib or non-voluntary contribution mechanisms. But even more, if Emily goes to the next slide here, Oh, sorry, I'm going to pause for a moment. I forgot that I'd thrown in this slide here. Um, of, of interest to people and certainly something, Emily, can we go back to the slide before? I think I might've put this in the wrong spot. I did put this in the wrong spot. It was of interest to folks. There we go. We'll jump back and forth for a moment. Sorry, everyone, that I threw the slide in the wrong location. If we look at the voluntary opportunities, the conservation lottery ticket, which I'll show you in a second here, a, a model, was very much of interest to people as something that they would be interested in contributing towards to, to then support conservation, tangible products, and the conservation license plates. If you'll recall, most of these percentages were closer to about 20% or lower. And closer to 60 or 50% are saying that they'd be interested in this in the future. So making sure that the opportunity for people to give in these ways, I think is a really useful thing to be thinking about. So now we can go to the slide where we look at the, the model from Colorado. You all are probably familiar that um, in Colorado, they have what they call the GOCO lottery fund, that about 50% of the funding goes to parks and wildlife projects and the other 50% of funding goes to local government and land trusts. So this is a case study that we call out in the state, or sorry, in the regional and national report, if you're interested in hearing more about how Colorado made that happen for them. 
So take home here is wildlife viewers in Minnesota want their financial support contributions to contribute to conservation. And uh, another insight that we found is we asked people about all these different ways that um, the money could be spent and if that would encourage them to give even more. And regardless of whether we were talking about opportunities for viewing or review opportunities for conservation, they were interested in giving more if they knew what the funds were being spent on. So I, I think that that's another thing to keep in mind is there seems to be a lot of potential to be working with these various types of viewers on these financial um, contribution mechanisms. And a key way to do that is to tell them how those funds are going to be spent and make sure that they can see that connection. So an example of, of how that's been done in another state is um, the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources created a program called Restore the Wild that probably some of you have heard about. Uh, they, they did this about three or four years ago, building upon survey insights from a project that we had been doing with them at the time. And they wanted to, to rethink how they could use their access pass as a way to get viewers excited about contributing to the agency because the access pass was just not um, having much interest. They only have wildlife management areas. It's not an agency that also manages parks. And so they, they thought about re-envisioning this as more of a membership opportunity more in lines of sort of like what a nonprofit would do, um, particularly since they don't get funding from people's taxes um, and or income taxes or state taxes. And, and so it was a way that people could actually contribute to the agency themselves if they aren't already involved in hunting or angling. And what they did is they really emphasized how these funds would go towards habitat of non-game wildlife and habitat projects. And so the, the connection there was really of interest to a lot of the viewers. And we'd previously done focus groups where they'd said, we will give money if we know it's going towards something that is of interest to us. And so they've seen that come to fruition. And it's also been a way for them to increase their connection with viewers. They've created a variety of events around the Restore the Wild program. People can get involved at various membership levels and receive different benefits from those membership levels as, as well. So another sort of opportunity to think about. So those case studies, if they're of interest to you, or I think we have several others that we didn't call out here today, um, they are written up in the regional national report. There's also one on the, the Minnesota uh, efforts within there as well. So, so check those out if you want to hear more about them. Um, and I see some folks calling out in the chat pod some opportunities um, as well that you have um, in your state. And I can answer those specific questions in a moment. So let's talk about what's next with the, this project. Um, as Kelsey mentioned, we're continuing to work with Minnesota DNR. Um, we have been surveying folks who are current supporters of the non-game wildlife program. Um, and we have also been um, having these focus groups with BIPOC audiences, but for the, the broader um, project, we put in a, a phase two multi-state grant and we have been told that we should be getting it. We haven't gotten the official yes from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but um, it was forwarded by AFWA and the directors. So this project is, is going to allow us to work with state agencies even more on applying and implementing these results, which we're super excited about. And our lab, we're really um, dedicated to making sure that the research we do matters and that folks who um, have, have uh, expressed an interest in using our data are supported in, in doing so. So this project involves a few key components. I'm just gonna call out some highlights here. We're going to make sure that we've um, shared this information even further at workshops, conferences, and meetings. We're particularly aware that uh, there's strong interest in making sure that leadership level positions and agencies are aware of these findings and so that folks who make decisions about program um, programs related to wildlife viewing or could make decisions about that understand the potential to work with wildlife viewers. We're also supporting a community of practice with agencies to help them implement survey results. So we're inviting agencies and, and we're hearing that Minnesota DNR is gonna be involved in this too, um, 
to uh, join a community of practice that meets about monthly and is guided through the process of developing a single project that they would really like to work with others on that requires them to think about using the survey results specifically for working with viewers in their state. And they can decide what sort of project is of interest to them and they also can work with their peers from other state agencies and, and be able to brainstorm, share ideas, and also get feedback and, and support from us. And we'll work folks through developing a plan and then supporting them as they implement those projects. Um, and then finally, we're going to have a website where those example projects are all showcased and the resources from those example projects are available to other states who want to implement in the future. There's also an additional analysis component of the project. We'll be um, digging more into that rural and urban viewer component in line with someone's interest in the geographic side of things. Like I said, we do have the zip code information, which is going to allow us to do more, more work and more spatial related analysis. And our, our colleague, Wilanja um, Chavez, who's been a collaborator on, on our project with your agency as well, um, is going to lead that analysis. She does a lot of research looking at the rural to urban. Um, uh, uh, framework. And then also, I think there's a lot of potential to look at income level, levels of specialization and age. We probably aren't going to be able to dig into that, but we've heard from people that that would be of interest. You all have access to your state agency's um, data set now, so that might be something that could be of interest to some of you as something that you might want to look into more. And then finally, the accessibility challenges component. It's really of strong interest to Emily. And she is writing a chapter of her thesis related to that, looking at people who said they had accessibility challenges and those who didn't, and trying to understand more about how state agencies can support them better. And so look, look for those um, insights coming soon in the next year as, as Emily publishes that work. And finally, I, I want to mention the Pathways Conference. It's going to be a gathering place for our community of practice, also a place where we're going to have an additional symposium about this effort. I'm also going to be giving a, a presentation there and being able to highlight this project to the, the whole um, group of, of attendees. It's also a great opportunity for any of you who are interested in learning more about wildlife viewers or learning more about broadening relevance to a, a changing um, demographic and changing set of values of, of wildlife um, enthusiasts in your state to attend a conference. This has generally been a conference attended by um, a lot of human dimension specialists, probably the human dimensions folks in your state have, have attended it. In fact, I think I've seen Adam there. Um, and so it can be an opportunity to connect with human dimensions folks, but this year is being co-hosted by Colorado State, Virginia Tech, and the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. So the goal is really to make it a gathering place for a, a lot of folks across all components of the state agency who are interested in thinking about people who share those um, value set that's that's more in line with like a wildlife viewer that sort of caring and protection component of the way people are, are thinking at a growing rate about wildlife and, and how does your agency work with that when it might not be the type of folks that you have worked with as much in the past. All right, so in conclusion, as we've shared with you here today, a lot of results, a reminder that there's even more if you haven't heard enough here. Um, so check out the report, or if there's something you want to clarify from what we've said, or if you'd like to be able to look at, with a little bit more time at the graphs or see the tables behind the graphs, all that data is, is there for you, in addition to the data set that Emily mentioned um, earlier. So check those out, and again, we really encourage you to look at the executive summary and the recommendations section in particular. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me or Kelsey or Emily. I know Cynthia is also available to you if, if you have any questions from, from the agency side of things to talk about this. And we have plenty of time here to, to take questions before we wrap up. Um, if you are needing to, to head off at any point, we really would like to ask you to take this super short evaluation survey. I know you're like these social scientists and their surveys. We promise it's short and it really helps us improve our presentations that we're doing for various states. And then there's also a component where we'd like to hear from you the response to that question I asked you at the beginning of the presentation of, of what do you think you might do as a result 
of what you've seen in this presentation. That will be really helpful for us to hear from you on because we can then be thinking about phase two of our project and helping support folks who have those sorts of interests for implementation. So um, again, a plug for that. And I wanna make sure though that I have plenty of time for questions. So Cynthia, do you wanna tell us what questions you think we should hit on first? Or would you like to say a few additional things about the survey? All I wanted to say um, really is kind of a housekeeping is uh, we will have the recording of this and we will distribute that. So it is a lot to take in. I've, I've heard a few of these presentations and I have read the report and I helped write the survey and it's still a lot. So um, we'll have that available to, to have uh, people can play and of course those who miss this as well. Um, I guess I'm kind of interested in people um, speaking out here. Um, I, I was intrigued by Chris's question about integrity and uh, transparency. I think if somebody wanted to look at that, I'm not sure we really got at that, but you all might have a perspective on that based on your experience. Then after that, I would say we just um, let people type or, or I think people can unmute as well. So. Yeah, I can start with answering Chris's question and I might ask Emily to add a little bit to on additional questions we asked about trust. Um, so we don't have insights specific to Minnesota, but in Virginia, when we did focus groups with um, specifically with birders and then also with broader wildlife viewers, and they shared with us that they why they're hesitant about currently giving to the agency and that they would be more interested if they knew that funds were being used in a certain way. They also said, and we want you to report back to us. We not in a like, you need to show us your, your, um, your uh, financial reports, but they said they wanna hear how that money was being spent. So they were interested in if they gave a donation, getting a sort of annual report on that at the end of the year. So what they've done with the Restore the Wild project is is put on their website as well as send out, I believe it's on a yearly basis, um, information about the projects that they actually funded because they've funded specific habitat projects. And so they've really made sure that they take that seriously and go back to people and be able to, to report specifically on those projects. Because um, you do raise a really important point that people might think, and I always wonder this when I give donations to, like, you think it's going to a certain fund, but is it really going to that fund? So I, I think being able to showcase example projects is a nice way to, to make that connection. And Emily, I know that you also had a whole array of additional trust-related questions about whether or not agencies were thought to be trusted, mm -hmm. et cetera. And you can share sort of the, the general take home on that, which we didn't present here today. Yeah, Chris, just before moving on, I, I did want to spotlight. So when we asked viewers, it, would you be more likely to increase your contributions to the DNR if you knew your funds were being used in another way? And the viewers said we we would increase our funds if we knew our, our, they, our donations, I'm sorry. We knew our funds were going to supporting conservation of the types of wildlife that they like to view, so those mammals and birds, or if we knew it supported the conservation of rare and vulnerable species. So those are two things to keep in mind. We did also examine the trust and like the trustworthiness that wildlife viewers reported in the M and D and R, and they reported overall that they had pretty strong trust in the agency. So it was about like a like a slightly or moderately agree on the scale that we looked at. And I think it's important to note that we also took a closer look at, at how the M and D and R would like um, fulfill their promises and other stuff that they would do as an agency. So if that's something you're interested in, it's about figure 49 to 53 in the report if you want to look at that, so you can get a little better understanding of the perception of the agency. So if you want to see that data on trust and, and level of trustworthiness, check that out in the report. But I, I think that's a positive take home is that people are probably already trusting of your agency. So there's probably not gonna to be too much concern that you aren't telling the truth about how you're gonna spend the funds, but I still think reporting back is, is probably a wise thing to do. Uh, let's see, Kelsey, are there any other questions that you've seen that you think we should answer here? Yeah, we had a question um, from Jeff about how we already have multiple opportunities for donations. Uh, is marketing the key to raising participation? 
Yeah, Kelsey, do you want to jump in and answer what your thoughts are on that? I know it's something that you're working on right now um, with the agency. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to jump in and talk about that. Uh, I think marketing is a big opportunity for raising participation, especially as we see this shift with younger people engaging in different types of, especially media. So traditional ways of marketing or traditional ways of reaching people often aren't as effective as they once were. Uh, so I do think being able to say, hey, here's like, here's what we're seeing uh, in this specific realm and finding the appropriate people. Like we know the Nage Wildlife Program has a wonderful and very supportive core of Eagle Cam supporters. And the Eagle Cam is watched by a lot of people across Minnesota. So being able to find those specific uh, niches for people where you can maybe say people who want to have a beautiful license plate, <laughs> we have wonderful critical habitat license plates. So being able to find those niches and sort of reaching to those people, I think could be a really effective way at marketing without having to really advance the number of options that we provide. Because I know the state of Minnesota has quite a few, like you mentioned. And Kelsey's also, um, as, as I mentioned, doing an additional survey right now of folks who are on Eagle Cam and, and other um, mechanisms that connect to the non-game wildlife program and is, is digging in specifically to what are some of the, um, the motivators for people to contribute. So that's something that she'll have some more insights on in the future as well. Yeah, I just, if I can just piggyback on that because it gets at a couple of the questions I've seen here or the comments the next that phase that the surveys are out, we're about to wrap it up uh, soon or close the open period, but it was really looking at who are the people that are kind of supporters of the non-game program, like they give us money in one of the several ways, or they um, volunteer for us or they engage in some way. So they're kind of an advocate or supporter of us. Bert, and then the other uh, sample size to compare to are people who really don't know who the non-game program is, but they maybe know about DNR or parks or something. So we're kind of trying to, to pull out some of that, uh, learn from that kind of comparison. So that's what's going on right now. Great, okay. thanks so much, yeah. Cynthia. And I, I see that Lisa has asked a question about that, or made a comment, but also it sort of asked for more insight on the slide about merchandise. And Lisa mentions that, you know, that it's important for an agency to think about how this is handled because in some agencies, the merchandise component has fallen on staff who may have a lot of other job responsibilities. So Kelsey, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, I wholeheartedly agree. I think that sometimes that merch offset can be really challenging because people expect that small organizations or small divisions within the department can then somehow handle all of these uh, wild orders, sometimes very large orders. And I think what we've seen for other states in getting around that is hosting through uh, specific sites that they do the printing and they do the shipping and they do all of the management of that. They basically just send uh, whoever is hosting, they send proceeds to them. And I think that can be a really effective way to get around this having to manage, because obviously that is a full-time job, having to, to manage and ship and take orders for merchandise. Thanks, Kelsey. I'm going to answer a question that Allison brought up. And Emily, I'll give you a chance to weigh in too, if you want to add anything to it. So Allison says, that um, they were surprised that see how many people, um, were, how many of the non-consumptive users were also buying fishing or hunting licenses within the past five years. And is there maybe some blur between this consumptive versus non-consumptive? And I think you're spot on, Allison. I think there could be components of people bought it, but then they didn't actually do it. Or in some states, we've seen that people will buy a fishing license because it gives them access to the wildlife management areas, and that's the, the cheapest way to go for them. Um, so they may be doing it for reasons like that, or they may be buying it for their kids, which is what I do when I buy a, for a fishing license. Um, so, you know, I think that that is something to be thinking about as well, is that it may be that another family member is actually involved on the consumptive side but the family member who took the survey isn't. So 
I think it, it raises a good point that people may not be so much, I just identify as this type of um, wildlife viewer if they have a lot of other people that they interact with who may be from a different identity of, of, of wildlife recreation. Emily, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, so I just want to add that there's a chance they may be wanting to financially contribute to the agency beyond a donation, and this is one of the easiest ways that they know they can contribute to the agency and their funds may be used for some form of conservation. Yeah, and you can see that Chris just gave us evidence of that in the chat right there, um, saying that um, they, buy, they buy a fishing license, but very rarely go fishing, so um, that, that could be happening as well. Um, let's see, Kelsey, I'm, I'm missing what else has come in. Is there anything else that we should be um, responding to here? It looks like people are just adding some of their own experiences. Great. And like Cynthia said, anyone who wants to make a comment or um, ask a question, um, you can also take yourself off of mute by asking to unmute or, or raising your hand with the hand raise function that's found under reactions. So if that's easier for you, you're welcome to. Ashley, I would love to hear about some of the peers here in the agency, what ideas they might have for, you know, any ideas they had from the recommendations and all. Um, it could be questions too, but I was just throwing that out that yeah. either verbally or spoken, I'd, it, to me, it would be a great chance to kind of hear what parks, wildlife, what people might be thinking they uh, for ideas. Yeah, so any parts of the, the recommendations component that we called out really resonate with people. You can put that in the chat or you can make a comment. And is there anything that you particularly think should be pursued in Minnesota, whether it be by yourself or by someone else in Minnesota? <laughs> we'll give you a second to respond there in the chat if you want to throw anything in and we'll see what people have to say. Or if anyone wants to raise their hand, we're happy to have you talk. So I'm seeing Andrew calling out that it'd be really useful to have more cross divisional work going on. You know, for the example of bird feeding, it could be an opportunity to have collaboration amongst the BearWise program, and then also thinking about um, ways to, to work with EWR program and support people and being able to bird feed, but also not be feeding bears in their yard. And it's funny you bring that up because that's an issue right now in my neighborhood it is the time of year where we've got bears all over the neighborhood. Um, I see someone else, Jeff, bringing up doing more education programs, trying to have more wildlife viewing programs, such as the Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship webinars being a place to have more viewing programming. Cynthia, do you have any responses to either of those as we wait for more to come in? No, those are great. Um, I think I'll, I'd like to see both. I'd love to do more collaboration, Andrew and and. Jeff on the wildlife viewing, I think all of those are great. Um, I'll say from the non-game program or EWR, we're kind of taking in these results. You know, they're really hot off the press, plus the additional uh, phases we have coming in. And I, I think it'll, you know, we'll be absorbing it and, and planning some different, you know, new directions or some add-ons. So those are great. Um, one thing, since I'm speaking and I'm reading at the same time, that I'm always a little, I puzzle over the, some of these results on people wanting to view close to home and, you know, like their yard, their property. What does that mean for people that don't have a yard or property or how do we as an agency kind of uh, short of, you know, purchasing additional wildlife management areas, which are primarily for hunting and you don't hunt close to people's homes. You know, how do we kind of, I think that's a, a topic that different divisions in the department could, could talk more about and, and that one puzzles me just a bit, so. Yeah, that's a great point, Cynthia. And and I, I think that you're spot on that a lot of agencies think about that too, is do you create more places or, and, and how do you do that for people who aren't don't have a backyard? Um, 
and and how do you work with local communities in order to make those opportunities available. Um, and Lisa asked a great question that I think we'll take as our last question. And I'm going to throw that one to Emily. Um, and I'll give you a second to think about Emily as I say a few things. So the survey was conducted at, a, at an interesting time. It was conducted um, in the midst of the pandemic in, in fall of 2021. And um, so we did actually really look into that. And Emily is writing a, a chapter of her thesis about this, but um, isn't as far along in the analysis on it, but we asked people about their viewing before the pandemic, their viewing during the pandemic, their viewing into the future. So Emily, do you think the around the home um, insights or interests are just because of the, the pandemic or primarily driven by the pandemic? Well, Lisa, we examined wildlife viewing around your home, away from home, but within state and then outside of Minnesota during a typical year, the, co the first year of the pandemic, and then their anticipated viewing in the upcoming year. And we actually found that in Minnesota during COVID, wildlife viewing in all three locations decreased slightly, so even around the home. But we noticed the most dramatic decrease took place in viewing outside of Minnesota or the United States, just to touch on that. And I'd say that the trends that you see from the national survey from 2011 to 2016 with the increase in around the home was before the pandemic too. So I, I do think that it sort of been regardless of of the pandemic but you know may into the future see even more interest in around the home opportunities yeah gas prices playing a role too all right well our time is up together you all have been very engaged which we really appreciate thanks for all your comments in the chat and um, just a reminder to take that brief um, evaluation survey either on your phone or um on the survey link that Emily just put into the chat. Again, we'd love your feedback. And uh, we look forward to continuing to, to work with you, Cynthia, and your staff, and, and have other opportunities to share what we're finding in subsequent spaces of the project with the broader agency. So thank you so much, everybody, for being here today. And thank you, Cynthia, for arranging this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.